Hi, hello. So um, thank you everybody for coming today. I'm going to talk to you about influence marketing at m and um, I'm Hannah, I'm International Social Marketing Manager um, and I'm going to start off today by talking to you about um, how to plan a successful influencer campaign. So it's similar to how you plan any other marketing campaign really. So first of all is clarity. So you need to be clear about what you're trying to achieve and whether influencers are the right tool to help you achieve that. I mean, they're good at some things, but they're not great at everything. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, measurability. In order to um, achieve that kind of clarity, you need a clear and fair KPI for measuring success. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of um, return on investment a bit later and how you can kind of maximize that. Um, but setting a KPI that relates back to the cost that you've paid is kind of key to understanding the success of an influencer campaign. Um, next up is precision. So selecting the right collaborator. This is something that a lot of brands can struggle with. Um, but I'm going to give you a few more tips on that again a bit later. And then finally is the last phase, which I think a lot of brands are struggling with, which I'll talk about quite a lot. Um, maximizing and extracting the value um, from every collaboration that you have. So 84% of marketers feel proving ROI of influencer marketing is a challenge. It definitely is a challenge. And it's something that you will struggle with with a lot of top funnel marketing channels. So like I mentioned, setting a clear campaign and goal is key to understanding the relationship of the campaign with return on investment. So set a relevant KPI to your campaign goal and use cost per results metrics to allow for benchmarking that. So if you've got an awareness campaign, reach and impressions is definitely relevant. But CPM is obviously related back to the cost that you've paid. So that can help you um, prove the return on that investment. From a consideration phase, you might look at engagement. But uh, likes, comments are kind of don't really mean anything unless you relate that back to what you've paid. So CPE would be a great um, metric for that. And finally, decision. So the conversion side of the phase. I mean, I wouldn't recommend anyone do an influencer campaign and expect sales and return on, uh, and ROAS. But I appreciate from a kind of trading team that that's something that marketers do have to kind of factor into their um, communications. Um, so it's definitely set out with that awareness and consideration phase at the forefront. Um, but keep it in mind that you're going to have to have a level of that uh, sales and ROAS at the end. So. Mark, why, are, why are marketers working with influencers? So marketers list a brand promotion as their primary reason for working with influencers. And we do the same as well, m and International. We actually work with a tool that helps us understand um, how we can reach the right audience. Sorry, let me show you a drink. <laughs> I think what a, lot, what a lot of marketers will fail to do here is like look straight at reach. How many people can we reach? But I think the mistake there is that they're not looking at who they're trying to reach. And that ultimately, looking at the audience of that influencer is key. I think a great example of a brand doing this well is Chili's Water Bottles, who actually collaborated with Zana Van Dyke. On the surface, she's a fitness influencer. You might not look at her, and she might have been overlooked by Chili's as not that relevant to what they're offering. But she's managed to cultivate an audience who have an interest in sustainability, hence the success of that campaign. For us at MS, we um, use a tool that helps us look at various different demographics of an influencer's audience from their blog and their, channel, uh, and their social channels. This helps us to align that with our current customer, our target customer, based on their age, gender, region, and cities, allowing us to pick an influencer that's going to allow us to reach the kind of audience we want to reach. So I'd urge you in an awareness campaign to think beyond reach and look for the audience that you're trying to reach for a successful campaign. Choosing the right influencer can help create relevancy within a receptive target audience to ultimately drive business. And I think this is where you're trying to push a customer from an awareness phase into a consideration phase. And I think the key word here is relevancy. For m and our challenge was a few years ago um, that we were seen as very uncool, maybe even unstylish. And we had to change that perception and be more relevant to the customer that we were trying to reach. The solution, we worked with an influencer to engage a, a group of fashion tastemakers who were known for their style. People followed them for their style and challenged them 
to, to, to wear MS product and inspire people to wear MS product. And as you can see, it's worked. <laughs> um, so another example of how you can be more relevant more often to your customer. In international, we trade uh, in counter seasonal markets like Australia. We're trying to sell essentially winter product in Australian summer. How do we go about that? So we use influencers, Australian influencers, to help us create seasonally relevant content. This market appropriate, it's still festive, and it's still the same product, but it's relevant for that target market. It's all about being more relevant more often to your customer. So that kind of brings me on to my next point. So with an average savings of 24%, talking influence uh, project that influencer content is set to replace stock images and professional shoots. This is something that we do across MS already. For as long as we've been working with influencers in, um, in international, we've been repurposing that content as much as we possibly can. We see value in the content in itself, and this is something that a lot of brands overlook. We have extensively A-B tested, I personally, because I used to work in CRM previously, um, emails that use brand content versus influencer content. And we've seen uh, average increases in click to open rate of 33% and an increase in sales of up to 22%. With editorial content, um, like this example here, we've seen exam uh, influencer content outperform brand content at plus 41% of orders and plus 1.7 percentage points uh, conversion rate. Sorry, it's really hard to say when you've got a dry mouth. <laughs> and to really make the most of that valuable content, this example here is kind of a perfect example for me. This is Irish influencer Louise Cooney. We use her content, uh, we, use, uh, we collaborated with her for Marks and Spencer Island. We then use, uh, she, she lives in New York, so then we repurposed that content across the Irish website, across the US website, because it was relevant. And, um, and that was also then reposted across different social channels. So we're getting the customer at every single touch point. We've got them in Ireland at the audience that we're trying to reach. We've got them in the consideration phase on social across multiple different uh, markets and channels. And then we've got them on the website where customers are there to convert, and we're using that as the ability to convert customers. So what's next for influencer marketing? In the future, brands and influencers will work even closer to build and foster communities that engage in a shared passion for what those brands make. So the final step of making sure that you can get the most value out of your influencer marketing is to maximize relationship value. If you find an influencer who has great, manages to reach the audience you want to reach, has managed to communicate the message you want to communicate, whether that be style or local relevancy, hold on to them. <laughs> they, they can be your biggest asset. Um, and if you work more closely with them, you can negotiate things like payments across a longer period of time. One-off collaborations are gonna definitely be more expensive. Influencers are freelancers at the end of the day. They work for themselves. If you pay them once, you get the cost for what, that one time. If you pay them over a long period of time, they're gonna get paid for a little bit longer. So they're gonna be a bit cheaper. And with that, you get more organic co coverage, additional deliverables, and they go that extra mile. This also presents a more genuine collaboration to their customers, to, their audi uh, to, to the audience, um, and builds a greater trust with the audience who value that level of consistency from their influences. And finally, this is not something that I've come on to, but it's a valid point that you could also block competitors. You can, help, you can start to own that space, that influencer space, um, to push your message. So to conclude, I'm not sure how clear that was. Um, my message to you would be to stop trying to prove influencer return on investment and in focus instead on extracting and maximizing the value of the collaborations you already have, whether that be through the audience, through their relevancy and their voice, or through their content, which you can repurpose across the site and in marketing. Thank you. <laughs> Do you see better performance from celebrity influencers, like some of the ones that have been mentioned, um, for, or from the more localised everyday influencers? I think, like going back to my first point, it just completely depends on like your overall campaign goal. Um, so we've worked with influencers, celebrity influencers, who've been great for that brand awareness. Um, and then we've worked with them again from a kind of style reappraisal perspective and they've not performed as well. Um, where you might have a niche or a smaller influencer who might have a bit more of a style um, 
what's the word I'm looking for, have a bit more of a style credentials that might just be the right message, the right influencer for that overall goal. We also have MS Insiders. I don't know if you know about our MS Insiders. Um, they're not, nobody knows who they are. They're just our staff and they wear just MS clothing and they wear it well. And they using, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not an insider. I might be today. Um, and that content is so valuable to us in order to help that consideration phase on our social channels. It's kind of a stream of regular content that we can reuse as much as we like. And obviously they're cheaper than your average influencer. And it's just whether they are known or not is kind of a bit irrelevant at that point. They're stylish, they, have, they create great content that's on a level with some influencers. So I think it just depends what you're after. Um. Um, you might need to explain a little bit on this one, but do you think the implementation of the hashtag ad, gifted or in partnership with, has changed the way the influencers work with brands or how the audience responds to those influencers when they see those hashtags or taglines? I think, I mean, I've not been in the role for a million years, so I, I kind of came in before I started in the role, but I definitely see a trend in influencers themselves trying to prioritise making the right decisions with the brands that they work with. I think they're aware that they need to protect their audience and they need to protect their engagement. And if they just work with anybody, that's going to kind of ruin their, their engagement and credibility and their trust in their followers. So I definitely find that influencers are coming back and saying, you know, we want to work with you, but we're being selective about who we're working with. And that for me is a complete bonus because we want people to work with us who want to work with us. Um, and that definitely comes across in the content as well. They do a little bit more, they work a bit harder, they come across more enthusiastically. They're keen to invest in that relationship. And that's a relationship that obviously I want to cultivate from a marketing perspective too. A couple of more, if I may. Um, do you only manage influences in-house or do you work also with agencies, affiliate networks, partners, platforms to help manage and grow your, affiliate, your influencer program? We do all of those things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so personally, I manage um, a couple of different agencies who help us um, from an island and uh, US perspective. Um, and one of those is kind of more on a PR side of things, um, which we don't kind of get that same level of insight. But what, uh, the one that I kind of showed you with the audience demographics and stuff, um, that's kind of more helpful in terms of looking at who we, who we want to collaborate with. It's just a slightly different angle on what we're trying to achieve. And actually that's our US influencer marketing, which is kind of a bit better because I don't often know who they are. And I like, because we're not working with the big old influencers in the US, um, they're far too expensive. US influencers yeah. are really yeah. bloody expensive. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, who are the Canadian one? Meghan Markle. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, God, no. I wish I could talk about her a bit more. Sometimes she wears our stuff and it's like, oh. But anyway, yeah. Um, okay, one of those I know you're not going to be able to answer, so let's move that one. I'm sorry. Um, did, did mother of daughters have a negative impact or generate more brand awareness regardless of her actions? I wouldn't have an answer to that question, unfortunately. Um, that's kind of a UK side of the business. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, sometimes there's not enough of a crossover between the UK influencers that we work with and the international. Um, but what we do find is that regardless of who, for example, Holly Willoughby is, she can still get great engagement internationally, even when nobody knows who she is, um, because she's she's just got a different look to a model. So it's it's not always about the it's not always about the influence themselves. It can sometimes just be about the type of content they create and how relatable they are. So maybe that answers your question. But last one. Oh, God, I'm getting grilled over here. Sustainability policy, of course. And yeah. how does that influence the influencers that you select that you want to work with? I think there's quite a lot of influencers who want to talk about that. Um, we use 100% sustainable cotton in all our clothing. And that's something that influencers want to push front and centre. And any influencer who, um, you know, wants to push that message for me is kind of... A winner in my eyes. <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thanks. Great job. Thank you.